In the early days of colonization, the Illinois country consisted of endless stretches of prairie. In the south, sunlight was choked by the dense foliage. No wonder rivers were the roads back then. But what could bring commerce could also bring invaders. Hello, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Today we're visiting Illinois' first state park, which is located near Metropolis. For nations wishing to control the Indian and the fur trade, or the frontier lands, this was a strategically important place. When the French and Indian War broke out, French commanders were worried about British intrusion into the Ohio River Valley. From Fort Deschards, the seat of France's government in Illinois, troops were sent out to build a new fort. This bluff is a great spot. 33 miles downriver is the Mississippi. Just up there by the bridge is the junction of the Cumberland and the Tennessee rivers. So from this spot, soldiers could see anything coming up from the south or anything coming from the west. Today, visitors can wander through the original fort site as uncovered by archeological digs. Close by is a museum that houses artifacts found on the site and which tell the story of the several structures that stood on the same spot. Three forts were built on this spot. The first in 1857 was to have had stone walls like the shards, but money and materials were in short supply. So they used trees found along the riverbank, such as birch and cottonwood. Unfortunately, those are soft woods. And because of that and hasty construction, the fort had to be rebuilt just two years later. That new structure was named Massiac after the French Minister of Colonial Affairs. The outline of the old fort still remains. At the corners, the French made bastions, raised platforms on which cannons were placed. Against the walls were the buildings that held the living quarters, kitchen, and powder room. The only time the fort's defenses were tested occurred sometime later when Cherokee Indians unsuccessfully attacked. It was the only battle ever fought here. Meanwhile, the sun was about to set on France's new world. The war was not going well, and these walls here were a haven for troops fleeing the advancing British. Oh, and uh, further evidence of France's declining influence was that Massac was the last French fort built in North America. In 1763, the Treaty of Paris was signed, officially ending the French and Indian War. Lands west of the Mississippi had been ceded to Spain. Those east of the Mississippi now belonged to Britain. After the last French troops left, local Indians burned the fort, reducing to charred remains this outpost of the once mighty empire. When the British came to formally take possession, they discovered the fort was gone and continued on to Deschards. While the British had no need to rebuild the fort, they did leave a lasting impression. Apparently they had trouble pronouncing the name, so they just shortened it to Massac, and that new name has been used ever since. In 1778, 13 years after the British claimed the fort, another military invader arrived. During the Revolutionary War, West Virginia Governor Patrick Henry wanted to solidify his state's claims to these lands, so he ordered a force into the Illinois country to capture British settlements. Today, a statue commemorates the leader of that expedition, George Rogers Clark. He came here not realizing that Fort Massac had been abandoned. He went on to capture Kaskaskia without firing a shot, and then he went on to take Vincennes. America now owned the land, but problems still arose after the war. Local Indian tribes were very hostile to the idea of new settlers, and Spain, which still controlled the land in the west, was eyeing the Illinois country. In 1794, President Washington ordered General Anthony Wayne to rebuild the fort. When the Americans arrived, they liked the style of the French fort so much, they built theirs right on top of it, using the outline of the old fort. 
Next to the archaeological site stands a reproduction of the American fort. Instead of bastions, blockhouses were erected at the corners, which not only provided an elevated lookout, but also served as extra living quarters for some of the men. Two years after its completion, Spain decided to test America's resolve. A gunboat armed with one six-pound cannon and eight swivel guns was sent up the Ohio River. Captain Pike, the commander of the fort, ordered a shot fired across the boat's bow. The ship turned around and, after filing a protest, went home. And, oh, the uh, captain who ordered that shot was Zebulon Pike, the same man who later led two expeditions across the Mississippi River and for whom Pike's Peak is named. The year is 1799. A new century looms on the horizon. Settlements are springing up in the new territory, and traffic is increasing on the Ohio River. Here the U.S. Treasury Department sets up a customs office to collect taxes on goods being shipped. During the day, an officer keeps watch to ensure that all keel and flat boats stop at the fort. The fort becomes a safe haven for weary travelers. Plus, it's also a gateway into Illinois for many settlers. And the Clark family returns. This time, younger brother William, along with Meriwether Lewis, begin their famous journey to the Pacific Ocean. In fact, they hire a local Frenchman by the name of George Drouillard, who is a skilled hunter and an expert in both Indian and sign languages. But the frontier is moving west. Illinois is becoming settled. In 1811, the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in North America rocked the U.S. The New Madrid quake was felt as far east as Baltimore. It caused the Mississippi River to flow northward, and it almost destroyed the fort. Before repairs are completed, the War of 1812 erupts, and recruits are rushed here for training. Unfortunately, they arrive just in time to experience a harsh winter. Inadequate shelter plus a lack of clothing and food supplies leads to many deaths. The repairs are never completed. After the war, since the frontier has moved west and is no longer in Illinois, the fort is abandoned. Caretaker is assigned to look after the wall, but he sells off the wood to passing steamship lines for fuel. Once again, the fort disappears from the banks of the Ohio River, but it is used one more time for military purposes when a camp is established during the Civil War to protect Illinois from another feared invasion. But those soldiers are not here long before a measles epidemic sweeps the camp, forcing its abandonment. At that time, Fort Massac seems destined for the pages of history. Shortly after the turn of the century, the Daughters of the American Revolution convinced the legislature in Springfield to purchase this site along with 24 acres. In 1908, it was dedicated as the first state park in Illinois. Since then, as we've seen, in 1939, archaeological excavations defined the parameters of the original fort, and later reconstruction of the American fort was completed. But the park is much more than just a living history. Today, its vista of the Ohio River brings not soldiers, but visitors from across the country. The park has grown to 1,450 acres, which offer hiking and camping facilities. And there's even a section set aside for deer and small game hunting. And while boats still arrive and depart from the foot of the fort, they're not gunboats, not commercial ships, but pleasure boats. Each October during the third weekend, this area comes alive with the sound of drums and battles. It's a special two-day event called the Fort Massac Encampment, with people in period costumes recreating life at the fort from the early French days to about 1820. For more information about the park and its special events, call 618-524-9321.